She's fighting. She's fighting for her life. Not a moment of emergency. Aaron's <laughs> dead. A savage murder of a fun-loving woman. It's something I'd never seen before, uh, except maybe in a movie. It was eerie. A crime of passion, crime of rage, and very improvised. A suspect's name written in blood. He has a criminal history. Is he lying? And if he is, why is he lying? He was married, and she was going to. Time is telling us you were the last person to see her. Who says that if they're innocent? Would you? No, I wouldn't. Every day in North America, dozens of people are murdered. The key to solving the toughest of these homicides lies in the final 24 hours of the victim's life. To crack the case, detectives must reconstruct that critical timeline. The minutes and hours containing evidence that can help unlock the mystery and catch the killer. Florida, a small southern town known as a great place to raise a family. Oldsmar is a quiet community, uh, about 15,000 residents. Uh, some would describe it as a bedroom community. Pretty much everybody knows everybody. It's kind of one of those areas where people talk to each other, everybody's friendly. There's not a lot of activity that you would consider to be suspicious. Typically, in Oldsmar, you know, you would deal with some property-type crimes. Maybe burglaries, maybe some... Except, on a pleasant Saturday morning, the quaint stability of Oldsmar is rocked by horror. Now, at a moment of emergency. Please, please come. Send the police. What's going on there, sir? <laughs> Karen's dead. Is that your wife? No, it's my girlfriend. It's what? I'm my girlfriend. I just came over here and I found her. Please, please hurry. Please. <laughs> Is this suspicious, sir? I would say so, yeah. I'm not, I haven't touched anything. I opened the door and she's in the kitchen. There's blood. Found her dead in the house. And she was on the ground uh, in a pool of blood. The victim is 39-year-old Karen Pinnell, an airline customer service representative. Karen was a very fun-loving person. She was always smiling, always laughing. But she wasn't afraid to speak her mind. She loved living in Florida. She loved the beach. She liked the fish. Uh, she, you know, kind of had a, a set of friends that she spent most of her time with. Veteran detective Larry Nelvin and forensic science specialist Anna Cox are tasked with solving Karen's horrific murder. They start by surveying the outside of Karen's home. There's a bird bath that was knocked over in the yard. There was a phone box that was open. The sliding glass door was open and there was a safety pin from the sliding door. It was laying right on the carpet. You know, it makes you think, was there a burglary? As you walk in the residence, you can see into the kitchen area. Uh, that is where Karen's body was. There were several sharp force injury wounds, which when somebody is being stabbed or attacked with a knife, uh, the common reaction that anybody is going to do is to defend yourself, to put your hands up, to try to stop it, to block it. Karen sustained 16 stab wounds to her neck, chest, and heart, leading detectives to question whether her murder was staged to look like a burglary. This is obviously a personal attack, somebody that was close to Karen. If this was a burglary gone bad, people typically do what they need to do to get away. Whenever you see excessive violence at a crime scene, in particular stab wounds, 12 or more, if not sexually improvised. This was over and over multiple stab wounds to her. So this was somebody that was extremely upset, not somebody that got caught off guard and was startled. This was somebody that wanted Karen dead and they made sure that they killed her. To solve Karen's murder, 
Detective Nelvin and forensic specialist Cox will have to reconstruct the final 24 hours of Karen's life. Timelines, extremely crucial. It allows us to put the victim in certain places at certain times. It allows us to put people of interest in certain places at certain times. So this puzzle together. Their investigation starts with analyzing the crime scene. There is blood spatter on the cabinets. There's blood spatter on the door. And then I look closer at the door and I see these three letters that are just beautifully written in blood, R-O-C. They're all capitalized. They are all the same height and width, and they're located several inches off of the floor. And I think the most interesting thing about them is that it's almost as though somebody very deliberately and methodically wrote these letters. Your first thought is, is this our murder suspect? Did Karen write rock on the wall so we would find it and know who had done this to her? If she wrote it, I logically am thinking she had to write it with her fingers. So I began to look at her hands and I noticed her left fingers did not have blood on the tips, but on her right hand, there's a little bit of blood on the tips of her fingers. It's something I'd never seen before. Really Karen writing that or not, or it was staged, it was eerie, either way. Because clearly somebody was either trying to tell us that Rock did it, or trying to blame Rock for something he didn't do. As investigators search the crime scene, they uncover an important piece of physical evidence. Also inside of Karen's residence is a pizza box, uh, missing three pieces of pizza. Uh, there's a receipt which shows it was delivered at around 8.48 to her residence on Friday night. So that's a good indication that Karen was still alive at 8.48 when that pizza was delivered. With the pizza receipt between 8.48 p.m. Friday and 10.30 the following morning. So at this point, we know that Karen had pizza delivered to her residence on Friday at 8.48. And we know that Tim Permenter called 911 at 10.30 in the morning on Saturday when he discovered her body inside her residence. Tim's involvement up to this point makes him the first person detectives want to talk to. Tim reports this crime. He has to be considered a person of interest, A, because of the relationship. Intimacy is a risk factor for violence, period. So the fact that they're having a relationship makes him as suspicious as well. Detectives bring Tim into the sheriff's office for questioning. He appeared to be upset, uh, visibly uh, emotional, and he was very uh, cooperative and said he would, you know, do whatever he could to help us figure out who had done this to Karen. Tim tells us that he met Karen about three months prior. Uh, he worked at a local car dealership, and then he actually leased her a vehicle. He said there was a connection there and they became involved in a romantic relationship. He described their relationship as good. They were talking about maybe getting engaged. They were looking at some real estate. Dig into Tim's timeline. Tim tells us that he went over to her house on Friday night at seven. He was delivering her this kitty calendar. Um, and while he was there, she, at that point in time, makes a phone call to call her, her dad for his birthday. He left at 7.30 and went back to his apartment in Clearwater, uh, where he has a roommate named George, and they played some video games. And at that point, George left to go to his girlfriend's up in Pasco County. Uh, and Tim told us that George's girlfriend, Vicky, actually told him to invite Tim to come up if he wanted to. Initially, Tim wasn't going to go, but he decided to go a short time. Tim then told us that he uh, got up in the morning and left around eight or nine in the morning before anybody was up, uh, tried calling Karen on his way back to his apartment. He was calling her cell phone and he was calling her work. Couldn't get a hold of her. And that wasn't like her to not show up to work. Karen had some health issues. She occasionally, I guess, would have blackouts. And so he was very concerned about her. So he decides to drive over to her house. 
When he gets there, he sees her car in the driveway, which was even more concerning to him because he knew, obviously, she hadn't gone to residence. And he states that the front door is slightly ajar. So he pushes the door open, walks inside her residence, and he sees her lying on the floor. He said he started to retch because of what he saw, and he was so upset. Uh, he backed out of the residence and called 911. But the more detectives interrogate Tim, the more questions they have. He said he didn't go near her body, even though the 911 dispatcher asked him to go check. Loved one that he was concerned about, that he went over specifically thinking she might have blacked out or something, you would expect him to go up to check her body. His behavior raises a red flag for detectives, but nonetheless, Tim continues to cooperate with the investigation. Tim consents to us taking fingernail swabbings and scrapings. We're taking a buckle swab for DNA. We're taking his clothing, and we're taking photographs of him. But despite their suspicions, when detectives look into Tim's alibi, everything checks out. Everything with Tim's friend, George. Detectives then ask Tim if there's anyone he knows who would want to hurt Karen. He tells us about a previous relationship that Karen was involved in uh, with the subject named Rock. Um, and he initially said, you spell it like Rock. However, then he stated to us, no, it's kind of like a mythical spelling. It's R-O-C. He didn't indicate that he saw Rock on the wall. He just told us about this relationship with Rock, which he described as violent and that he had been uh, in trouble before uh, for some domestic stuff with her. There's a reason the word rock was written on the door. It's because she has a boyfriend named out. At this point, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, rock is possibly the one that, that murdered her. Detectives have zeroed in on a prime suspect in Karen Pinnell's murder, a violent ex-boyfriend named Rock. Tim described Rock as uh, a drug user. Uh, he didn't like the guy, um, didn't think there was anything good about him. Anxious to help detectives find Karen's killer, Tim provides as much information as he can about her ex. Tim further tells us that that was still at her residence. Tim felt that Rock would come by once in a while when he would have something of his that was there and not get everything in order to have a reason to call her to come back again. I definitely kind of cued in on that. And now I know that we have to establish a timeline for Rock. Rock is an obvious suspect. You have somebody who it's alleged and documented that there is a history of domestic violence here. We know that this is an estranged relationship. So it doesn't take much to make the link that perhaps he could have acted in an aggressive manner and, and killed Karen. Maybe there's some sort of move he had given her back. Sometimes there's other sorts of feuds underlying these things as well. Rock's alleged violent tendencies are an important clue for detectives in locating him. We are able to find a report from our agency back in 2002 where uh, there was a family trouble at Karen's residence there where her and Rock had gotten into a fight and he had left and when he came back, she had locked the door and wouldn't let him in and he was banging on the door. Karen was scared. The police report helps detectives track Rock down. To kind of catch him off guard. So we surprised Rock at his residence. He was a little standoffish with us, but we introduce ourselves to him and we tell him we're investigating the uh, death of Karen Pinnell. Detectives proceed to question Rock about his relationship with his former girlfriend. Rock described the relationship he had with Karen as kind of, you know, not a really good one. He was over the relationship. He had his new uh, girlfriend that he was living with now uh, that I uh, believe they might have been engaged. So he was happy with... ...that he had repeatedly been harassing Karen over furniture she had of his. He's reaching out to Karen, trying to get this roll-top desk back. His 
His explanation was that it wasn't a big deal and that he was, he was done at that point. And then detectives drop a bombshell on Rock. He was really taken back um, when we told him that his name had been written in blood on the wall at our house. He was startled and shocked and kind of pissed as to who, who would try to frame me for the murder of somebody, of, of an ex-girlfriend. So that was very unnerving for Whether he killed Karen. He does tell us that, you know, he has a criminal history, but he says I had nothing to do with the murder of Karen. We were also aware of the fact that he did live at her place previously. And again, the fact that it's staged to look like there was a burglary. You know, and Rock would be familiar with the area. He knew where the safety pin was on the sliding glass door. He knew about the bird bath, the phone box. It makes you wonder. Detectives try to pin Rock down on where he was during the time they believe Karen was murdered. So Rock was explaining to us his timeline until about midnight or so, having some drinks at the house. And they both went to bed together, and they both woke up together around 9, 9.30, Saturday morning. We were able to speak with his uh, girlfriend, who he lived with, and she had a, you know, a younger son. She said that he was with them on Friday and was there Saturday as well. So at this point, we know a couple things. We know that Rock is a controlling and dark and violent person. And maybe his girlfriend and her son are afraid of him. So, you know, could there be a possible cover-up? The question, the other half, is are they just doing this to protect them? Are they covering for them? Are they complicit in the scheme themselves? You can't just take a person at their word. It needs to be fact-checked. Despite the fact that Rock's girlfriend was home, the timeline shows he still had the opportunity to murder Karen between 8.48 p.m. and 10.30 a.m. the next morning. So now I'm immediately thinking, is he lying? And if he is, why is he lying? Is he, is he lying because he was the last person to see her? Uh, because he was the one that, that murdered her? Detectives have their sights on Karen Pinnell's ex-boyfriend, Rock, as her possible killer. But they don't have any physical evidence to connect him to the crime, so they put his alibi to the test. Initially, when we're when we're having a conversation or interviewing somebody, you know, you're you're just trying to really get their timeline, and then what you do is you go back to try to see if there's discrepancies in it. When the police were conducting their investigation, they started to pull some of the information from cell phone towers. Detectives are hoping Rock's cell phone activity will provide useful information, but what they discover is surprising. Any telltale, you know, any clues that would indicate that he was not there. And his story is corroborated by other people. So he was eliminated as being a suspect. The fact that in this case, the victim's sort of dying act seems to have been writing her killer's name in blood. This is one of those clues that you that you never get. And when it shows up in this case, police are obviously going all in on this lead. And the fact that it doesn't seem to be panning out, at some point you need to question, is this a misdirect? Is this name being offered as a red herring? Is he basically being framed? And cell phone and text records. So we see this text message, which is kind of like a loving text message, a flirtatious text message from somebody uh, in there is built as like pilot. We're able to identify who that person is. Uh, we're able to track him down. He was a little bit hesitant at first to talk because he was married. When you have a subject that she has a casual romantic relationship with and you learn that he's married, uh, that obviously makes you think, could there be a possible motive there? Was, was there something going on and she was going to say something to his wife? Uh, and he knew that, so he All kinds of lengths to keep uh, their illicit trysts and affairs a secret so that there's no cross-pollination between their two lives. But this inevitably complicates investigations when you realize that a, what seemed to be a straightforward life is actually a spider web with suspects all over the place. And whenever some kind of secret relationship is revealed, 
they're naturally going to be a strong person of interest, the same as the known intimate partner, the husband, the wife, the boyfriend, the girlfriend would be. In fact, it actually elevates them, given that they are sharing a mutual secret. The pilot, about his relationship with Karen. He says that, yeah, he dated her from time to time, but it was a casual, romantic relationship. And then he tells us that he was flying the day before Karen's murder, and we have a hotel receipt as well from him. So we were able to very quickly eliminate him as being a suspect based on flight records and based on hotel records of where he was completely out of the country altogether. Detectives still believe that Karen's personal life is the key to solving her murder. Searching for new leads, they interview her friend in co Get more alimony from her ex-husband, Jeff. That's obviously something we need to look into because there are times when people you know, get very upset if you're trying to take something from them, specifically money. Money, they say, is the root of all evil. And sadly, a jilted ex-spouse, rather than part with their money, would rather actually kill the person who they once married. And to them, in their mind, that's, a, that's an appropriate trade-off. Detectives haul Jeff, Karen's ex-husband, down to the station for questioning. Jeff described their marriage as a good marriage. However, he said they were the reason why their marriage ended. Detectives asked Jeff about Karen's requests for more alimony. He said he wasn't harboring any bad feelings towards her at all. He had indicated he had had contact with her. However, at this point, was done with whatever was there and with her. Detectives are not convinced that Jeff is being truthful taking note of his overly comfortable demeanor with respect to the end of his marriage and his ex-wife's requests for more money. Karen has moved on, is dating other people. Should he wish to have her back, so to speak, this can be a real problem. The idea that as these things combine, you have increased provocations that lead you to feel more and more resentment over time could also increase emotion and, and lead to potential violence. Greed and money plus jealousy that's a very dangerous concoction. Detectives questioned Jeff about his whereabouts during the window of time that Karen was killed. He said he was down uh, actually in Miami, four and a half hours away on a diving excursion with friends. Uh, all of that was able to be corroborated. Hotel receipts were able to be corroborated, receipts from the dive shop and so forth. Confirmed that he on solid timeline and alibi for him. Uh, to know that it, he wasn't the one responsible for her murder. With Jeff ruled out as a suspect, the investigation into Karen Pennell's murder hits a wall. When you have a small town like Oldsmar, you do have that dynamic when a, a violent crime occurs where people really are scared. They are not used to this. They don't understand how this could happen. It's all very confusing. So there is that extra pressure to try to not only solve the crime, but to put the community at ease, which tell you anything, because I, I don't have anything to tell you. But detectives finally catch a break when the blood analysis results come in. I remember there was blood spatter all over the wall, on the cabinets, on the door. And one of the questions being presented to me was, how long would it have taken for the spatter to dry before the letters ROC were written on the door? And my conclusion was that the spatter was already dry uh, upon the time which ROC was written. And the reason I could confirm that is, A, microscopically, there was no disruption to the spatter stains. They weren't wiped away. Well, then I had to figure out a time frame. So it was several minutes after spatter had been deposited that the word rock was written. And she sustained severe injuries to major organs, like major functioning organs in her body that would have pretty significantly caused her to be incapacitated and un unable to sustain life for several minutes. So you have to assume that an individual who's dying is able to write that word in such a perfect nature. None of that makes any sense. After the initial attack, one, she wouldn't have been in a condition to write. Two, 
she would have had to lay there and wait probably an hour or two before she decided to try to write down the wall. She didn't write this. Somebody else wrote this. Somebody else intended to manipulate this crime scene and try to send all of us on some crazy whirlwind of an investigation, and it's not going to happen. Detectives confirm a key piece of forensic evidence in the murder of Karen Pen At that point, it was, it was a good moment for us in our investigation because it narrows our focus down to people that are intimate with Karen that would know about this relationship we had with Rock. Detectives catch another break when Karen's autopsy results come in. We learned that her stomach was empty of any food, which was... Uh, interesting because we knew there was pizza delivered to her residence and we know there's three pieces missing well she didn't eat them so who ate them in the hope of finding answer the delivery driver and talk with him and he very vividly remembers delivering the pizza to karen's house uh, he described her as an attractive female that he delivered the pizza to he had a bit of an accent, and she commented on his accent. So they were having this casual conversation in the front porch area of her residence, and he remembered a gentleman being there, standing in the background inside. And uh, he said he thinks that he upset him uh, because as they were having this conversation, uh, maybe it was a little bit flirtatious, and he said this subject kept uh, needed to stop having a conversation with her and leave. Uh, and that's, that's how he described it to us. So that, to me, is a very big revelation in this investigation. Detectives need to identify the mystery man who was with Karen on the night she was killed. They're hoping there could be fingerprints on the pizza box and direct forensics to go down this road in their analysis. I'm looking for some type of indication of even a partial fingerprint. While detectives wait for the fingerprint analysis, they uncover more details about the nature of Karen's relationship with Tim. Through our records, uh, we see a report where a, a couple weeks prior, she had uh, called 911 and hung up. So the deputy goes to her residence for a 911 hang up call. And it's determined that Tim had come to her house. She called 911 and he left. Detectives track down the responding officer, and what they learn next blows the case wide open. The deputy did a criminal history check on Tim and saw that he was out on probation and he had done 12 years in state prison for attempted murder. So he took an informed Karen of this and about his history and that it was for attempted murder. It's clear that Tim was quite accomplished at leading a double life. He had convinced Karen to be with him, and yet he had this whole other past that she rightly would have been quite concerned about. I think she would have felt betrayed, and Karen may have confronted him about it, and he was upset about it. So it was all pointing in this big, huge arrow straight at Tim. Detectives dig deeper into the in Gainesville area and the Tallahassee area. We learned that back in 1990, he was convicted uh, for attempted first degree murder and kidnapping, which involved an escort and involved him also trying to take out this competitor. Detectives have Tim Permenter in their crosshairs and haul him back into the station for questioning. So as we're talking with Tim, we asked if Karen knew about his prison stay. And he told us that he had disclosed that to her at the beginning of a relationship because he indicated she, you know, she had to get over that. It took her a little bit of time to get over his past. He stayed with him. We know from the 911 call made about a week prior to her death that she realizes that she's been lied to by Tim this whole time. And the cops who attend on that evening tip her off to the fact that he's a known felon. Detectives theorize that Tim Permenter is the murderer, but without physical evidence, they can't prove it. 
A lot of pressure is put on us by ourselves because we want to bring closure to this. We want to, one, take a murderer off the street. Two, we want to get closure for the family. Uh, what's happened to their family member, their loved one, their friend has happened. We can't change that. But it, it's, it's salt. Who's been living a lie his whole life. He's dabbled in all sorts of crime, uh, criminal versatility being a good marker of psychopathy in most cases. So you know you're not necessarily going to get a confession from him. He's not going to cooperate. It'll be one lie after another. So at that point, you really need to focus on what forensic science can tell you because forensic science doesn't lie. Detectives have zeroed in on Tim Permenter as the prime suspect in Karen Pinnell's murder. We have him go over his time. Tim sticks to his story that he was with his friend George and George's girlfriend at her place in Pasco County on the night of the murder. But when we really start pressing him, his demeanor changes. Um, it's kind of just this blank look on his face, this stoic, um, almost dark, a little less open and closed off and short. So at that point in time, uh, he told us he wanted a lawyer. And we placed him under arrest for the violation of probation because he was up in Pasco County and we're able to get him held in the jail while we continue. The results from the fingerprint analysis on the pizza box and the findings are explosive. They were able to positively identify a fingerprint on the pizza box as belonging to Tim Fermenter. That was huge at that point. Tim had told us he had left that location at 7.30. We know for a fact that he was there at least up until 8.48 p.m. that night. So there's a big problem with that. Specifically, he didn't mention that he was still there beyond 7.30. He said he was, at that time, playing video games with his roommate and then preparing to drive up to Pasco County, when in fact, we know he was still at Karen's. Hey, that you left at 7.30, and the pizza was delivered after 8.30, and your prints are on the box. The timestamp on that receipt directly contradicts the crux of your story. Forensically, time is telling us you were the last person to see her. But detectives still need more evidence to verify their case. Tim's cell phone records are the last piece of the puzzle. Once we received all the cell tower information, it again destroyed his timeline. And George, from his apartment, to head up the Pasco, he's calling George from Karen's house because the cell tower it's hitting on is directly north of her location. So we have him at her house at least up till 9.30, which was probably right after he murdered Karen and he was trying to figure out what he's gonna do and how he's gonna handle this. Detectives present Tim with the mountain of evidence they have against him, hoping it will compel him to confess. She got pizza delivered shortly after 8.30. We know you were there at probably 8, 30, 35, up until around 9, 30. Is there any reason that there would be blood on your shirt from her? I don't know how, but that blood is on my shirt. I didn't kill Karen. I wasn't there, but it doesn't matter. So just do me a favor and call my sister so she can come pick up the car, take me to county, because that's where I'm going right now anyway. Anyway, the minute I saw the body, I should have run. So who says that if they're innocent? Would you? No, I wouldn't. I would fight it the whole entire time. So he's, he's somewhat giving up without admitting to it. But we've already started our, based on the delivery of the pizza and based on those statements that he makes, we know we have our guy. I promise you that. Detectives are now able to piece together what happened during the final 24 hours of Karen's life. Karen left work on Friday around 6, stopped at a uh, grocery store around 6.30, uh, and then went home. Uh, we know that Tim was over there at least once. He indicates 7 to 7.30. But we also know that he was back at his apartment at 8 uh, when George left. 
The pizza was delivered at 8.48 to Karen's house, and we know from the PO that Tim was there because his fingerprint was on the pizza box. So that gives a catalyst as to what might have started this argument at their residence that night. And the relationship is not going the way he wants it. She's trying to get out of that relationship. You get this guy that delivers pizza. She starts having this, what he perceived as probably a flirtatious conversation, which pissed him off. And that was obvious from the delivery guy I could see that. And of course, at that point in time, he's, he's a narcissist. He's controlling. And he's going to decide whether it's done or not. And he realizes, she's getting rid of me. I can't have her. He doesn't want anybody else to. And he's pissed to make sure that she was dead. Tim then tries to frame Karen's ex-boyfriend, Rock, by writing his name in blood on the wall. At 9.30, Tim calls George, and we know that he calls her from Karen's house. We know that around 10.40, he arrives up in Pasco County where George meets him at a gas station, and Tim then follows George to his girlfriend's house. But why did Tim's friend George lie about Tim's alibi? Ultimately, George was scared. Uh, I think he's looking at a guy that's been in prison once for attempted murder and now just told him that he stabbed his girlfriend to death. He's scared of that guy, and he's scared that if he does say something, that he'll come after him, his girlfriend, or the kids. Tim ticks a number of boxes in terms of criminal psychopath behavior. We see it in his previous exploits we see it in his relationship we see it with his attempts to frame rock and we see it most notably in that after brutally murdering his girlfriend he gets the munchies and, and has to help himself to a pizza that's on the couch on october 24th 2007 tim permenter is convicted of the first degree murder of his girlfriend karen pinnell he is sentenced to life without parole by grieving for Karen Pinnell in this case, I allow myself to feel bad and I allow myself to be angry and I allow myself to be confused because none of it makes any sense. And at the end of the day, you murdered her because she broke up with you. It, there's never a good reason for murder, but that's one of the... With all homicide cases, a good ending, I guess, is putting the person that's responsible in, in prison for it. But it doesn't change what happened. You can't bring their loved one back. This family lost Karen, their daughter, their, their little sister, you know, who was a good person that everybody, everybody loved her. <laughs>